Well, good evening. Yep. Of course. Carol's always the first to show up. I don't know how she does that. She's got the fastest clicker in the West, I guess. Well, as usual, we'll wait a couple of minutes to get started here. And hope you had a good day today, Carol. Mine's been relatively calm. Had a little bit of activity going on today. Got a few things done. We'll see who else jumps on here. And if nobody else does, I'll just teach this class anyway and and uh, well good. I'm glad you had a good day. So we're gonna be in Colossians three. Colossians three, and we're gonna try to cover actually two lessons tonight because I missed a week. I was uh, I think I had no internet or something that week or I was sick or something happened. But uh, we're going to try to get in two lessons today because next week we won't be meeting. We won't be having a class on Wednesday of next week because it's right before Thanksgiving and I figured if people might be pretty busy baking pumpkin pies or some such things. Although I like sweet potato pies just as good as I do pumpkin pies. But if I had my choice, I'd have a pecan pie. Those are my favorite, particularly with some ice cream on top. High, warm them up, get them hot, put some ice cream on them. That's what I like. All right. Well, I don't see anybody else joining us yet. But I have learned that sometimes... There's people that sneak in, and it doesn't register up there. I don't know why that happens. They don't say anything, but I find out later that they actually watched. So I don't know. I don't know how all this thing works. But I know we need to get started, because i got a lot to cover tonight if I'm going to do two lessons. So let's pray. Father, thank you for a new evening that we have together, and I pray that those who are here and those who will join us later will all be blessed because of your word not because of anything i do but father we're just thankful that you have uh, left us instructions that you have given us ways to think about things that uh that correspond with with the truth with what is real what is authentic and we're thankful father that that we can uh, tap into that anytime we want to in your word and so bless us in our time tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're going to actually cover about the first um, 17 verses of Colossians chapter 3, and but I want to take it in two sections here since we're doing two different lessons. They're actually um, titled both the same thing, it, and it's, the title of it is What Plugged In Looks Like in the church. And so, obviously, Paul was writing Colossians Coloss, Coloss, to the Colossi church, and uh, he is instructing the people in the church what being plugged into Christ actually looks like. Um, and, you know, I know when I plug my uh, lamp into the wall, I know what that looks like because I pull the string or I flip the switch and the light comes on and so I kind of know what it looks like and 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 it, you know when I plug my computer in uh, I turn it on it boots up it I know what it looks like I know when it's not doing the right thing and this and the same thing is is true with those of us in the church those are in our individual Christian lives and our corporate lives we kind of know that um, whether we're really snugly plugged into Christ or not because there's a certain thing that happens when we are plugged into Christ. So that's some of what we're going to kind of be uh, considering tonight is that kind of idea. So in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, I'd like to read it first, and then we'll uh, take that part, of, that part of our study apart, and then we'll go to the next part. 
So this may be just a little longer than my normal 30 minutes. Okay, he says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And do not lie to each other, uh, since you have taken off your old self with its, its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, here there is no Jew, Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Okay, so how are we going to take this apart? Here's how we're going to do it. Embedded in... I would say practically all the scriptures. I mean, maybe there's some historical narratives where you would have a hard time figuring this out, but certainly in the letters of Paul, embedded in the in the letters are not just simply things to do or things not to do. There are fundamental truths that are embedded there that form the basis for our behaviors, for our practices. And if we understand those fundamental truths, then we can... Um, orient our lives in the right kind of way. They're, they're, and they're more than just simply principles to live by. Uh, sometimes they're historic truths. Uh, they certainly are spiritual truths. And they're things that are just bedrock. I mean, we, we must believe these things. These are not, these are not um, take it or leave it or opinion. They are bedrock truths. And so there are five foundational truths um, of the gospel, and these gospel, the, these truths of the gospel are not simply to be believed, but they're to be experienced in our lives. They are to be uh, lived out in a certain way. And so in the first few verses here of chapter 3, we find these fundamental truths of the gospel. And I would just simply encourage you to go, I'm not going to go over there and read it myself right now, but uh, and compare what I'm going to tell you with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 8, because there Paul is talking about the fundamentals of the gospel. He, this is the gospel that he preached, and he lays out what are the fundamental truths. You'll find, I believe, in Colossians 3, a parallel to what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 8. And you're not going to be surprised at what these fundamental gospel truths are. I don't think you'll be surprised by it, because number one is the death of Christ. Now, you can't get much more fundamental than the death of Jesus Christ. Well, where do we find that in the text of, of Colossians 3? Well, in verse 3, he says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, if you compare that with Romans chapter 6, for instance, it says that we die with Christ. When we're baptized, we die with Christ, and we're buried with Christ, and we're raised with Christ. And so here he mentions the death of the person, but that death is a death that corresponds to the death of Jesus himself. And so a fundamental truth is the death of not only Jesus, but our individual death with him. The second fundamental truth is our burial. And so if you look at verse 3 again, he says, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This idea of a hidden life is, I believe, reminiscent of the burial of Christ where he was hidden in the tomb. And, of course, he was hidden there with God. And, he, and of course, we know what happened next. But we also are buried with Christ in baptism and so this is a fundamental truth, the burial of Christ and also our burial with him. The third one, of course, is the resurrection. 
He says this in verse 1. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. We'll come back to that in a moment. He Being raised with Christ, of course, is a fundamental truth. He was raised, and we are raised with him when we come out of the grave or the watery grave of baptism, we say. And we're raised now to walk in newness of life. And so there is the death and the burial and the resurrection, but then there are also the appearances. Because after Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to many people, giving evidence and proof that he actually had been raised from the dead. And so in verse 1, um, I'm sorry, in verse 4, he says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so now there is this appearance that we have with Christ. Um, and 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 this is when, you know, originally when Christ appeared after the resurrection, it was making himself known to people. When we appeared with Christ, it is going to be evident who we are, who he is. That is that's the purpose of, of the appearing or the parousia is for, for things to be made absolutely clear. And so it happened that after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it's going to happen after we are raised from the dead. We're going to appear with him as well. And then there is the ascension or the reign with Christ. He says, again, back in verse 1, he says that after we have been raised with him, we set our hearts on things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Of course, when after Jesus was he died, was buried, and was raised, and appeared to people for a short time on earth, he ascended back into heaven to reign or sit down upon the throne of God. Uh, if you go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, it talks about this, and also in 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 13, where we're told that we as Christians will one day reign with Christ, and we will be seated with him in the heavenly realms. And we are, in, in a very symbolic way, already seated with him in the heavenly realms. And so there are five foundational truths of the gospel that not only are to be believed, but are to be experienced by the Christian. The death, burial, resurrection, appearances, and the ascension or the reign of Christ and us with him. Now there also in this text, there are four metaphors for the church. There are four things that we can kind of compare what it means to, to be plugged into Christ in the church. The first one is found in verse 5, and it is what I call the divine assassination. It is when we put to death, he says in verse 5, therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature, and he goes through a list of things that we'll come back to in a moment, but he says we are to put some things to death. There has to be a deliberate holy assassination. Now this may be akin and uh, very closely akin to the idea of repentance, uh, that we are changing, we're putting to death what is sinful within, within our lives, you know, and and not only is it being, uh, we're being crucified with Christ, and he is taking our sins away, but we're making a commitment to no longer live in those sins. And so I call it a divine assassination. So people who are in the church, who are plugged into Christ, are people who are constantly putting to death the evil things in their lives, the sinful things in their lives. The second metaphor is uh, what I call a, a holy about face. <clears throat> a holy about face. And so in verse 7, uh, he says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Well, if you used to walk, then it means you're not walking that way any longer. This was your old life. You're doing a holy about face. You're turning around and walking in a different direction. Again, those who are plugged into Christ are people who no longer walk in their old ways. They are people who have turned around and are walking in a different direction. The third uh, metaphor for the church is what I call good riddance. And so in verse 8, he says, uh, he says, but you must also rid yourselves 
of all such things as these. And he goes into a list. We'll come back to that in a minute. And he says, you must rid yourself of these sinful things, these sinful practices in your life. And so there is a good riddance. Of course, that's akin to the divine assassination, the holy about face, and now the good riddance. Get rid of those things. Take them to goodwill or whatever. Get them out of your house. Get them out of your life. Don't uh, let them hang around. Uh, you don't need them. Put them on the curb. Let the garbage man pick them up. Get rid of these things. And so if we're plugged into Christ, there are certain things that we're going to get rid of. The fourth metaphor is a metaphor that's called renewed clothing. That's what I call it, the renewed clothing. You'll find it in verse 9 where he says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self. Okay, so there is a, and other other places it talks about putting on Christ as 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 you would putting on a garment, putting on clothing. You clothe yourself with Christ, if you will. Um, but here he's talking about this renewed clothing where you take off your old self because your old self is dead. You, why you want it? It's kind of like the old old uh, uh, snake skin. Take it off. It's, it's no longer useful to you. Get rid of it and put on the new self. And, and so I call this the renewed clothing Get rid of the old clothing. Uh, it's probably smelly, not not very nice anyway. And put on the, the new things that, that Jesus has given us. So here are the four metaphors that he gives us for what it means to be plugged into Christ. If I'm plugged into Christ, I I am uh, I have assassinated uh, the old man. I have done a holy about face. I'm walking in a different direction. I am I'm saying good riddance to some practices that certainly do not need to be a part of my life anymore. And I am putting on some new clothing. So I'm being renewed in, in, these, in this new clothing. And so, um, so those are the four metaphors that he gives us in Colossians chapter 3 uh, in about verses 5 through 9. Now, I have another section here that I call the devils in the detail. Uh, the devils in the detail. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, if we're going to if we're going to be plugged into Christ, we have to understand that there's some very specific things that Christ has in mind for our lives, and so He mentions them. And I'm not going to elaborate on them, but He mentions uh, about I don't know how many there are. I didn't count them. It's A through K in my notes, but He He mentions sexual immorality, impurity lust, evil desires, greed, which he says is idolatry, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, and lies. And he says, and you'll find these in verse 5, verse 8, and verse 9 of Colossians 3. He says, these are the kinds of things in the details that we have to get rid of. On one level, we get rid of the old man. But what what is the old man made up of? You know, I want to know what the what the nose is, what the ear is, <clears throat> what the elbow is. I want to know the details of the old man and what is it that I need to be getting rid of. And so he gives us list, and you'll find this in several places in, in the New Testament, list of sins. You'll find one at the end of, of Romans chapter 1, quite an elaborate list. And you'll find it several places where, where I, I think, one of the things that um, the New Testament makes clear, it doesn't just give us a, a list like the Ten Commandments, uh, but um, he he gives us um, other words, things he identifies as being sin. So we need to be familiar with, with those things. And so if we're going to be plugged in, we give attention to the very the the detail things that need to change in our lives. We may have a problem with sexual immorality or, or a problem with evil desires, a problem with rage, a problem with slander or lies, you know, whatever it is that we may be having a problem with, then we uh, need to get rid of that. And then what does a plugged in life actually look like? Well, I believe there's two good summary statements that are found in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 3 that help us to understand what that looks like. And so in verse 10, he says, 
I'll read this again. He says, and have put off the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. So this is the first thing. Those being renewed after the image of their creator. Now, I, I like to liken it to um, to a coin that has an image on it. You know, if you have a penny, it has Abraham Lincoln on the penny. And if you, if that coin has, uh, you know, it's kind of old, it's been around for a while, it's been uh, circulated, it may have uh, gotten in the dirt, it may have, it, it, it's, it's, it's been through a lot. It has a lot of dirt and grime and scratches and all kinds of things on the surface of Abraham Lincoln's face. And so what, what has to happen? Well, it has to be renewed. We have to put it in some chemical or we have to, um, uh, we have to clean it up really well, scrub it. We, it, there's a renewal process that, that we're a part of. So if I'm plugged in to, to Christ, I am constantly in a renewal process. Uh, imagine some machine, like our vacuum cleaner, I guess is a, a good illustration. Is It's almost like a vacuum cleaner that you never turn off. It, it just constantly is vacuum, vacuuming up, up something. It's cleaning something. It's, it's renewing something. Um, and so there is a process in our life where we're constantly being renewed day by day. Uh, and and so what does it mean to be plugged into Christ? That application is constantly at work in our lives. The second thing he says, a good way to understand what it means to be plugged in, is found in verse 11. He says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. He's just simply saying, it doesn't matter who you are, what your station in life is, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, whether you've been circumcised, haven't been circumcised, whether, you, whether you're a, a barbarian or a, a Scythian. The Scythian was a particular section uh, in, in the northern part, kind of up towards where Russia is now. Uh, whether you were born a slave or, or you were born a free man, it doesn't really matter who you are. The, the the one truth of your life is Christ is all and is in all. So if I'm plugged into Christ, Christ is all. He's pouring into my life. He's replacing me. Uh, and I am in him. He is my all and I am in him. And so if, if you are a person who are truly plugged into Christ, Jesus is going to be all over you. I mean, he, he's just going to be the the he's going to be the most important person in your life he's the person you're going to talk to he's the person you're going to spend time with he is just going to be the the person who is your all so this is what it means to be plugged into the church now i told you we'll go a little bit longer uh, tonight because i'm trying to get two lessons in tonight so the second one is found in colossians chapter 2 3 verses 12 through 17. Okay, Colossians 3, um, uh, 12 through 17. I'll read that section for us now. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Uh, if you have, if, if any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ, or the, or the word of Christ, dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another uh, in all wisdom, through psalms and hymns and songs, from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, just as in the last section, we had some foundational truths, and they were the foundational truths of the gospel. Here we have some foundational truths as well in this particular section, but they are, they are truths of, about who we are. You know, I, I need, there's so many... Uh, 
ways to look at, and I wish I had a better word than foundational truths, but when you're building a foundation of a house, it's got to be the solid part of your house. It's got to be something that never moves. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, it's the truths, and because true is true. It, it, it is, it's the same today, to yesterday, tomorrow is true is true. And so it never changes. And so you want to build your life upon things that don't change because so many things change around us uh, in our lives. There's circumstances and we get older and, you know, kids come and go and we, you know, uh, sickness and health and all kinds of things change in the political scene and, and everything. But what are the fundamental truths of our lives? And so one way to look at those is like the gospel truths, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Another way to look at it is the identity truths. Who is Jesus, you know? But as important as who is Jesus, when we become Christians, who am I? What is my identity? How do I view myself? And so there are three um, fundamental identity truths that he gives us in this section. The first one's found in verse 12, where he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people holy and dearly loved. And so he's talking about how what a special people we are that were chosen, were chosen when the gospel when we when we heard the gospel, it was the invitation and through the gospel he chose us to be his people. And so when we accepted that, we became a part of the people of God. But we are a holy and dearly loved people. That's who we are. We see ourselves as holy people, not because uh, we're not holy because we're perfect. We're holy because he makes us holy, because he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But we're also a dearly loved people. We're a people that that we know we're loved by God. We don't have any doubts about, about uh, the fact that he loves us, and we can take confidence in that. And so that's one of the first uh, uh, identity things that I have to get into my head is that I am a chosen person. I am holy and I am dearly loved. The second identity um, uh, comment that he makes in this section is found in verse 13. He says very simply uh, in verse 13, he says, we'll bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And so if I see myself as a forgiven person, then it's going to be easier for me to forgive other people of when they sin against me. And so part of my identity is to know that I am a forgiven person. And so that's the second um, identity truth that I need to uh, kind of nail down in my life. The third identity truth is found in verse 15 where he says, uh, since as members of one body you were called to peace. So the third truth is that we are members of the one body of Christ and we are people who are called to peace. Knowing who we are uh, as, as, um, as part of the body of Christ, knowing that I am some part of that body, uh, I may be a mouth, I may be... I don't know, eyes, I may be feet. I'm, I'm some part of, of the body of Christ helps me to nail down my identity that's in Christ. And, and as a part of the body of Christ, I'm called to be a peaceful part of the body. Now, I think there's a very practical application to that. I am glad that uh, most of the time the parts of my body are at peace with one another. I would hate to, I would hate for you know, my, my, uh, my fists to have uh, a conflict with my mouth because, you know, the fists <laughs> probably would get the upper hand of the, and, 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 and sock me in the jaw. And so, uh, you know, the body is to be at peace, is to be in unity and in, uh, and in uh, cooperation with all the parts of the body. But I need to see myself as a part of the body of Christ. I'm not in isolation from other people within the body of Christ. That's one reason the church itself is so important. That's one reason, 
you know, being with other Christians and being a part of a local church is so important. And so we have these three foundational truths in this section. Uh, and then this, after that, we have actions that follow. Now, just like in the last lesson we did earlier, uh, there were things that you take off or there's things you remove. There's things you rid yourself of. And he has a whole list there of all these negative things that you get out of your life. Well, in this section, he's talking about not just the clothing you take off, but the clothing you put on. And so here he says, in verse 12, he says, Clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And so now, just as we've taken off that old man and the old self and all of the, the, the garbage and the baggage that goes along with that old self, now we're putting on the new self. And, and it, what does it look like? Compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And so we have now uh, this positive aspect of what it means to be plugged into Christ. And so there's kind of two things that happen when I'm plugged into Christ. One is you plug in and you get rid of a bunch of stuff. But also you add a bunch of stuff into your life. You begin to acquire new things in your life. And so you're really replacing the old things with the new things in your life. And I can assure you, <laughs> the new things are a whole lot better than the old. You know, it's, it's so much better to live a life of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience with people than it is to live in this old way. So how do we know we're plugged into Christ? Well, one of the ways is, is by what we're putting on or what we're putting into our life. If we're not seeing these changes being made, you might need to check the connection on the plug. It may not be plugged in very well. And so that's what he's talking about. But there's some other actions that follow that are just as important. He goes into a lot of detail here. The, the next one is found in verse 13 where he says, bear with each other. Bear with each other. We'll, we'll get each one in, in, in turn here. But when you bear with each other, that you endure with one another, that you put up, in a sense, with one another, that you, uh, you're not constantly, you know, when there's a conflict or there's a problem, you're not simply uh, removing yourselves from one another. You're, you're bearing things together. You know, you're bearing burdens. You know, you don't quit on each other when things get hard. You stay with one another through life. And we do that in marriage. We do it with our kids, but we do it with our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Is is that we we just don't give up on people. And then in verse thirteen, he also says we forgive um, grievances that we may have uh, with someone else. Uh, we do that because we've been forgiven. And so you know, Jesus taught about this. If you have something against your brother, you know, you you go and you be reconciled with your brother. Um, and, or if you see your brother's sin, you go and you, you tell him the sin. If you, you know, Galatians chapter six, you know, you, if you see someone who is caught in a sin, you go and, and you, you, uh, uh, bear the burdens of that person. And so we forgive grievances that we have because that keeps the body of Christ pure. And then he says in verse, uh, 14, he says that we are, um, uh, he says, we are to put on love that binds all these things together. And so the five things that he mentions here, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Think about all those things being bundled up and there's a big cord around them uh, that is the cord of love that binds all these things together because they're, they're really aspects of what of what love is. Uh, love is compassionate. It is kind. It is humble. It's gentle. It's patient. It is all those things. And so love uh, is is the kind of uh, summary word for all of those traits. And, and because it causes us to be in perfect unity. When you bind something together, you've got all these different loose things together and you tie them up. They're unified now. They don't just fall apart and, and go everywhere. And then he says in verse 15, 
that we let the peace of God or the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And again, Paul has a lot to say about having the peace of God, that when we're anxious, we pray, and, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He, he taught, taught that back over in the book of Philippians. And then here he's talking about the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. And, and, and so Christ's rule in our hearts is a peaceful rule. It's not a war a, 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 a being at war. We are no longer enemies of Christ. We're in peace with him. And if I'm in peace with Christ, I can be in peace with other people. Because, you know, as much as it depends on me, he says in Romans chapter 12. And so let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And then he says in verse uh, 16, 15 and 16, he says, be thankful, be thankful with gratitudes in your heart. You know, when you, when you sing, sing with gratitude in your heart, be, be a thankful person. And, um, and I, and I heard a message on, on the radio this, this week, I was driving in my car and the message basically said that the way to remove doubt uh, in your life is through thankfulness is that when you observe what god is doing for you then you're thankful and you're more inclined to believe and trust in god it works that way with human relationships as well you know if i'm doubtful about you or skeptical of you but you do something good for me and i'm thankful for that it brings us closer together and so we are thankful people and then he says, let the word of Christ, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Those who are plugged into Christ, his word is going to flow into them and they're going to uh, have that word in a rich way in their lives. It, 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 brings, it brings richness to life. You know, the Christian life is not meant to be boring. It's, it's meant to be exciting. It's meant to be fulfilling. It's, it's rich. It is not poor it is it is not weak it's powerful and then he says we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom if we are people who are plugged into christ then again the words of christ flow into us but then they flow out to other people and we teach and admonish other people with the words that we have received and we do that hopefully with wisdom because we gain the wisdom of being with christ and walking with christ and then what else do we do? We sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing is a part of the Christian life. Now, I, you know, we, we can do it anytime. Uh, it doesn't have to be done just in church. We can sing anytime. And, um, and, and the, the singing, you, you know, will lift our spirits. It will be praise to God. It will, we, when we sing with each other, we, we teach each other in the songs. And so this, again, is what it looks like for us individually as a church to be plugged into Christ. And then he says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. And again, when we're plugged into Christ, we're representing him. And so it's in his name, it's by his authority, it's with his power that we do what we do. And uh, if you can't do it in the name of Christ, you probably don't need to be doing it. <laughs> and so think about Think about, again, in this lesson, two parts of the lesson. What does it look like to be plugged into Christ in the church and in our individual lives? It's based on those foundational truths, the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, appearances, ascension, back to the rule of Christ. Those truths are dominant in our lives. It is based on the truth of who we are, that we are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved we are forgiven people and we are members of the one body of christ called to peace because those things are true in our lives then we we have a behavior of getting rid of things that don't need to be in our lives and adding to our lives things that will make us more like christ we remember we're being renewed in the image of our creator so this is what it looks like to be plugged in. And so you can check that every day. Uh, and you can check the plug to make sure it's not coming out of the socket. And if you find yourself, uh, uh, 
outside the will of what we've talked about today in any of these points, then that's when you need to be concerned about the plug and about whether you're firmly attached to Christ. Because it's going to make all the difference in the world. Well, didn't do too bad. Only went about 10 minutes over. Got in two lessons tonight. Again, next week uh, is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Yep, it's almost Thanksgiving. And uh, so we will not be meeting on that Wednesday night. And so our next time will be on November the 30th. Now, on November the 30th, I have to check my notes here. We're going to be um, talked about how to be plugged into society. How to be plugged into society. So we're going to look, be looking at basically the remainder of, of chapter uh, 3. We're going to chapter 4, verse 1. And then on December the 7th, we will talk about what it means to stay plugged in, Colossians 4, 2 through 6. So this is relatively short. And then we're going to, on December the 14th, uh, finish up uh, this uh, series uh, talk, talking about being relationally plugged in, about, you know, what it means to be plugged into one another in a, in a little different way. So... That's where we're going. So the middle of December, we'll be done with this, this series called Plugged In. Again, God bless. Thank you for joining me. And hopefully others will jump on here later and, and get this as well. Thank you.